the subject of today is uh, self-service versus uh, upmarket. It's a very broad subject because uh, obviously when you, you start a, a SaaS company, your first objective is to spread your technology everywhere to ensure adoption. Uh, uh, and then you have to make money, unfortunately. Uh, and when you start to have to make money, you have to go through different stages, uh, different type of customers, uh, different, uh, at the end, go to market and, and same strategy. So our panel today is a very, very uh, interesting one for that, uh, that question uh, with different stories. Uh, first, I, I will start with uh, Alix. She's uh, the founder of um, a company that most of you may know, uh, AB Testi, uh, and she will uh, present his company and uh, his background. Her uh, background, sorry. Uh, Judy is uh, the, the CMO at uh, Mailjet, uh, also a well-known company for uh, anybody that has mail to send, uh, with a good level of security. Uh, Anthony. Uh, coming from New York and uh, manager of business development for Trello. I can imagine that everybody knows Trello and has uh, abandoned all the post-it uh, everywhere, <laughs> in, including in his private life. And, uh, and Rafi, uh, who is a partner at a famous uh, VC firm uh, in Paris, uh, Alven Capital. I'm very happy to moderate this, uh, this panel. Uh, I am the, the president and um, chairman of the board of a, uh, a company that just uh, uh, changed uh, its name. Uh, the former name of the company was Augur, and we merged with uh, our competitor and uh, partner in the US named Fashion GPS. The merge is now a company named Launchmetrics, so it's uh, roughly a 20 million SaaS company. We deliver platform and, uh, and data. And uh, I have kind of a background of uh, 25 years in the software business. At the beginning, not SaaS, but now only SaaS. So I'm very, I'm very, very happy to uh, start this panel with, with a question, perhaps for uh, for Alex. Uh, you you started your your company, if if I am right, as an agency at the beginning, uh, and uh, and you you have developed the, the AB Testi solution. Uh, from that, uh, I would be happy if you can tell us a, a little bit the story of your company. And do you think that uh, as a SaaS company, there is a kind of um, standard pass? I mean, you should start with uh, freemium and, uh, or free <laughs> and uh, uh, go after that to uh, uh, something that is more um, volume sales uh, and after that increase your average deal size to go to uh, uh, big accounts and uh, key account uh, strategy. Uh, what do you think, uh, based on your story, uh, could be the kind of happy path to, to build a SaaS company? Yes, sure. Thank you, Emily. Um, so very briefly about uh, our story. So we began uh, six years ago with my uh, associate, Remy, uh, as an agency. We were working uh, previously in uh, traffic uh, acqu acqu acquisition, and we realized that uh, conversion rate optimization will become the next uh, big thing. So we decided to, to, to raise uh, Liwio, which was a, a web, web analytics and CRO agency. And very quickly, we realized that uh, we, we did a consulting mission for our clients. And we, we realized that there were a lot of uh, very good tools for web analytics, but there were no good tools uh, for optimizing uh, the websites. When we saw that, we decided to, to build uh, a tool, uh, A-B Tasty, to empower web marketers with A-B testing and personalization, because it was seen as something very technical and very complicated. So we decided uh, to, 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 to create a very simple uh, and easy tool uh, to empower the web marketers. It was very interesting because we had some clients uh, on the consulting part uh, who test our uh, MVP. We started with the MVP, uh, something very simple four years ago, uh, and our clients have tested it, so we were in a real test and learn. Uh, that's what we do, so that's great. <laughs> uh, we were in a real uh, test and uh, uh, learn uh, thing, and we decided to to our client tell us that the pro told us that the product was great. So we decided to to empower the, the product to implement new feature, etc., etc. And finally, we uh, we started uh, four years ago, uh, three years ago, the, the the tool, 
and to release the tool, uh, AB Tasty. The interesting thing is that at, at the beginning, to answer your question, uh, we wanted to do uh, a freemium and to uh, do it for uh, small companies, uh, to target small business. Uh, but finally, uh, it was the big brands and uh, the enterprise, who large accounts who came to us. And uh, we realized quickly that uh, one uh, contract with one big company was uh, the equivalent of uh, 500 contracts with uh, small companies. So we decided to focus on, uh, on large companies. Uh, when was it, this uh, kind of... Uh... I think that we launched the product at the big... Uh, four years ago, in 2012, and I think that six months after, we, found we had a lot of incoming leads. Uh, because there was not a lot of, uh, of tools like that on the French market, so we had a lot of incoming bins. So we decided to focus on large accounts very quickly. And uh, we, as well, we, we switched our positioning because at, at the beginning we were an agency. We decided to focus on the SaaS, of course, because we saw that there was, it was, that there was a lot of scalability. Finally, we, we focused a lot of, on large accounts. And I think that it was a good strategy because uh, like four years after, we, we, have, uh, uh, we are leader on the French market. Uh, we have 300 uh, medium and large accounts uh, in France and uh, abroad. We have... Uh, we have 80 people and uh, we are uh, in, uh, in six countries. In my experience, but I think it's going to be very different with, uh, with Trello, for example, because uh, I, my target is large company, medium and large company. I sell the product, but I sell as well uh, professional services. So it's 75% of uh, product and 25% of professional services. So that's, uh, a kind of, that's a different type of SaaS than uh, Trello or, or MailJet because I think that you don't have uh, professional services. So this is my advice. Uh, when you target a large account uh, is of course not to do a freemium and to directly uh, sell, uh, sell the, the tool and the professional services. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Uh, do you have a few things to add to this uh, first topic? I was just going to say there are tons of different SaaS models and uh, actually MailJet's quite similar to uh, AB Testy uh, in the sense that we do, when we venture into the enterprise world, we do have a professional service component that's on added on top of uh, the product itself because mainly driven by our customer's demand. The enterprises have a different product demand, different onboarding service demand, service level agreements demand. So. We do try to provide what they need uh, with a customized solution plus a really kind of tailor-made um, service component. I th and I think that you know your point is um, a good one, Judy. Is that you know I think that you know, as, as you're starting you know, companies in SaaS, like a lot of this is experimentation, and you see what people are willing to pay for, and you find out more about those needs. And I think that you know at Mailjet, I know that you know, you know self-service to start and then bigger companies started coming on and those bigger companies were willing to pay for uh, professional services. And okay, there's another revenue stream that's there. And I think that, you know, at Trello, um, it was similar that, you know, we started just with our, our Trello Gold, which allowed you to have stickers and backgrounds and it was just like a way for people to pay something um, because they really wanted to. But, you know, as we launched Business Class, um, you know, we realized also that we had, you know, some really big companies, thousands of users, uh, uh, that at, at some of these companies and recognizing that they had very uh, a distinct different need and that they were also willing to pay for for that need um, so we launched the enterprise plan last July so I think that that evolution um, and even thinking about kind of yours your you know, AB testy is like that evolution of okay we people need more help and you know, we can talk a little bit about you know more about kind of self-service and sales and like you know why why approach that but I, I think that you know, when the product um, requires um, some guidance and, and help, that that sales and you know, kind of uh, you know, side of thing is, is really important to, to bring on earlier. When um, you're, you know, the product can be used self-service, um, then uh, you know, optimizing for that after. <coughs> I would say that the, the product, uh, I think it could be interesting if you share with us the different stage that, that you had at Trello okay. uh, and what has been difficult in um, moving your business model to something that was really freemium uh, and, and capturing these big accounts. What does it mean in terms of sales organization, in terms of marketing? What are the, the, the key challenges that you had to face? Yeah, well, I, I found that Trello is a very incremental um, organization in how they've approached some of these. Um, you know, at first the product was just completely free, and then it was like, okay, you know, we're going to allow people to pay us, so we'll have Trello Gold and allow some customization, and and actually having, um, you know, people want to give us five dollars a month uh, for stickers and backgrounds, like that's awesome. 
Um, and some people were just like, we don't want you to go out of business, we want to give you money. <laughs> um, I, I then uh, eventually Trello launched a flat rate plan uh, for $200 um, per month uh, for the business class features, which allowed um, some uh, greater permissioning control, uh, as well as um, you know, allowing some of the, uh, these, these add-on uh, add functionality. Michael Pryor will say that that was like one of the biggest mistakes that we made because uh, what we found was that there's these massive organizations that have hundreds of users that are paying $200 per month. And it's like, okay, well, you're paying pennies per user. So last year they made a change um, to correct that mistake um, and uh, launched business class, um, a new version of, of uh, business class and uh, the enterprise uh, version. And so, you know, kind of how we've evolved as a team to keep up with that uh, is that the marketing team, um, you know, brought on one person to focus on, on marketing and building out kind of the content community and social media side of things. And then the uh, eventually last, I think it was about 16 months ago, we hired our uh, VP of sales and she just, you know, got in there and immediately started selling, you know, going calling some of these companies that had hundreds and thousands of users and seeing, you know, whether or not she could sell them you know, the business class plan and then finding out that, hey, there's some enterprise features, so okay, let's sell, sell them an enterprise plan. Um, and, you know, and I think that when I say that Trello is very incremental in that way is that uh, as each of those teams saw success, each team grew. So uh, as the VP of sales was more successful, um, with selling to some of these, she's like, all right, I'm gonna hire the first salesperson, and then as the second salesperson, and then the third, and then it was like, okay, we wanna hire an SDR, so they hired an SDR. And um, you know, now we're doing... Um, you know, SDR, is, is that clear? Yeah, sales, okay. yeah sorry, sales development. Um, so, I mean, now uh, I think that we started that sales team um, 16 months ago or something like that, and now we're doing over 10 million uh, a year in revenue. And so uh, yeah, very much incremental um, in, in that regard, and uh, I think that 45% uh, of our revenue comes um, outside of uh, the U.S. today, and that's also, I think, a credit to um, you know, really focusing on internationalizing the, the product early. So, uh, Just going back to this uh, SDR, yeah. um, my, my personal experience is that to really grow your SaaS business, you have to be really sharp in um, all this demand generation process. So the, the, the intermediate step between uh, marketing, able to capture the leads, the ability to um, qualify, transform these leads into something meaningful, usable by sales, having this uh, funnel really smoothen with key metrics that you are able to measure. And that's really uh, something that you have to build from the early, early days, from the beginning, to make sure that you scale something that is scalable. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it's more difficult um you know, to put, implement that after the fact. Um, but I mean, I think that sometimes as, you know, we're founders and you know, starting companies early on, it's like, when do you decide to put all of this process in place? And when do you decide to hire, you know, to specialize? I, I think that that's challenging. I'd be, you know, curious to, you know, hear what everybody has to say about that, but. Judy, perhaps it, it's a good question because you are the CMO, so. <laughs> Just a little bit about Mailjet. I sure. don't think, uh, I'm not sure if everyone here knows what Mailjet does. Uh, so Mailjet is an email sol solution for marketing and transactional emails. We send about 1 billion emails a month for uh, customers in 150 countries because of the SaaS model. So if you start with the SaaS model, your reach is ginormous. And because we focus international uh, on internationalizing our product from the get-go, we do have um, our product platform support services in four different languages, so it broadens the reach. So then the question is, when do we decide to scale up the sales? So Mojet, since it's you know nascent in 2011, has focused historically very very much on SaaS model. So our cheapest we have a freemium model. Our cheapest plan is five five euro a month um, up until, you know, thousand euro a month. Up until last year, we have taken a very uh, opportunistic approach to enterprise uh, leads. We do, as we build brand recognition in different countries, we started seeing a lot of great inbound leads, larger customers who not only want our product, but also want our consulting advices, services to help them improve their email strategy and practices. So. Um, as we see these opportunities, especially in key countries with SaaS, you can really identify which countries um, are experiencing really um, huge growth. Then you can strategically figure out 
where it makes most sense for you to build a sales force closer to customers, closer to providing the services, and to boost, again, um, you know, your credibility in the local market, and then, you know, obviously add to the, uh, the fuel for growing the SaaS um, business. So for us, it was last year when we decided that we were going to invest in the sales business. What that means is really invest in different geographies we um, decide to focus on. Currently, we are in seven different countries worldwide. Um, four countries have uh, a significant sales and marketing presence. Um, and as we figure out, you know, what the best approach to, to scaling up the sales force in these local regions with local talents, which is, again, a very important thing, um, we then have a better idea what the local market needs. So, for example, in Germany, um, data security is, first and foremost, the most important thing for our German customers. So then we decided that we're going to invest in infrastructure and server in Germany to better serve you know, our German customers. UK is very different um, from France and also very different from US. So as we discover these local nuances, um, especially to serve our enterprise uh, customers, we then could evaluate how we're gonna invest different, um, different market strategy there. Uh, we, we, we speak briefly about uh, this very interesting question about SaaS company. Do you need to do some um, uh, services to make sure that uh, your solution are adopt and uh, to, um, to increase the usage of your solution? And perhaps a question for Rafi, because uh, in terms of valuation, generally the, the valuation of uh, SaaS uh, companies are more based on the monthly recurring revenue uh, that you, you have. And uh, uh, the trend has been during the last uh, three years, perhaps, that uh, uh, the, the volume of uh, services that you add on top of your uh, recurring revenue uh, should be uh, low. Uh, it's moving, I, I think, a little bit with managed services and these kind of things. What is your point of view, Rafi, about that? When you see a company that has 30% uh, of uh, its revenue in terms of services, is it good? Is it bad today? That's a good question. Um, maybe I can say a few words about Alvan because we have a specific profile for all SaaS companies. Uh, we started 15 years ago with uh, with a central thesis that is that today we invest in the in um, the modular construction of the web, meaning it's a lot about SaaS. It's a lot about APIs, platforms. Um, so just to give you a few names and references, in the portfolio you will find uh, Algolia, Stripe, uh, Mailjet. Um, uh, Textmaster, uh, Beam, uh, and others. So we have a, a great variety of companies we see with uh, the profiles that you're mentioning. Uh, I'd say that there are fundamentally two families of SaaS. There's the first ones that address pure enterprise plays, where often it's bootstrapped with professional services, and at some point it, it flips slowly into product. So the uh, in this first profile, the, uh, what we want to see is whether uh, it's going to be 100% product, if it's going to be 20% professional services one way or the other because the product requires it and the customers want it, or if it's fundamentally a services business, that, uh, that's a bad idea about uh, SaaS, basically. And uh, the most successful SaaS companies, uh, especially in the enterprise sector, have a lot of professional services, meaning goes up to 20, 25%, because the products they sell uh, add a lot of value for the customers, and the customers want to be accompanied to, into the product, uh, want to be set up and uh, form, trained to, to, be, to use it. I wouldn't say it's a, it's a problem, it needs to be monitored, uh, and to, to answer the, the beginning of your question, uh, MR is one thing, in, indeed, I think the, um, the market is more sensible to growth in general and that the product uh, has demonstrated its product market fit rather than the, the exact percentage uh, of professional services. Th this is the first family. The second family is slightly different. It's, uh, it's uh, closer to the history of Mailjet, Judy was telling. Uh, in the self-service business, um, it's very difficult to bootstrap companies with professional services. Uh, it's easy to bootstrap in the sense that it's most of the time uh, customers that are easy to reach out. 
two, so you can reach the first 100K of MRR pure product uh, relatively easily. But professional services come in uh, slightly after because the, the, the self-service uh, businesses are often with the, with the low average uh, basket. And when you want to increase that, you slowly switch into a sales model. So you change the DNA of the company, you hire sales teams, uh, you add professional services. And that change in the mindset is relatively crucial to, to be able to reach the next stage. And again, there's no ratio that is strictly monitored. Uh, it should remain a SaaS company, uh, so probably 80% product. Uh, and again, uh, MRR and growth are what are beyond everything uh, way before uh, monitoring the, the professional services ratio. I go back to, to MailJet and, and to you, Alex, also. Um, I, I think that you have a quite a high ratio of, um, of, of services. How do you see this, uh, this activity? Uh, how do, man do you manage it? Uh, is it um, a profitable activity that you want to develop? Uh, and how do you mix your self-service model with a more uh, enterprise uh, service model? We discussed briefly with Alex, who said that uh, she tried to to, to have uh, the lowest uh, level of uh, professional services in ABTST activity. So uh, I would be happy to, uh, to have your feedback. Sure. Um, so as I said, since last year, we started investing in professional services, which is the enterprise offering. Just to give you a, a percentage of breakdown, up until last year, our revenue is 80%, 80%. 85% SaaS and 15% um, enterprise offering. Now we're at almost 40% enterprise offering, 60% um, SaaS service. So this just tells you how much more boost you can get from your revenue if you invest in kind of the, the professional service part. Um, one point I want to make about professional service is that um, as you develop these service offering, there are two things to keep in mind. One is um, you do need to start thinking about infrastructure quite early on, not only from a product perspective, but also from your team structure, your resources. Professional services typically require account management after sales, a different level of support reactivity, um, perhaps a, a tweak in customizing your product. So thinking about this ahead of time before you actually start the sales and marketing activity is super, super important. And the second thing um, that's worth to note is that from a pricing perspective, how do you price your professional service? Um, a lot of times, um, you can actually pass on a lot of the cost to these enterprises um, who are less price sensitive, but more product and service sensitive. So there's a way for you to figure out um, how to extract more value out of this segment. Um, as we think about developing this um, uh, de developing our enterprise offering more, we are heavily invested in not only infrastructure and um, but also resources because it's it's crucial for the success. And how we manage the difference between this growing the SaaS business and the enterprise service offering from a marketing standpoint is that we do need to develop a separate um, value proposition, um, separate set of messaging that would really speak to and resonate with this channel of customers. If we don't, then we risk kind of diluting our value and not really um, being able to be very successful in this separate channel. So developing a, a different set of messaging that would be more um, suitable for enterprise um, customers is very important while maintaining kind of the SaaS business. Just uh, um, to, to, to add something, um, uh, for example, at IBTC, uh, client satisfaction is uh, uh, one of our core value. Um, so for us, it's uh, strategical and it's very important. I think that uh, professional services as well, uh, I call it uh, anti-churn, because uh, you know uh, it's uh, uh, you know you build a human relationship with uh, with your client. Uh, of course, the, the product is great, but as well, I think that uh, to have, uh, uh, in IBTST, uh, we, we have a very, very low 
low churn, and I think it's uh, part of our strategy is to have a great professional services. So I think this is something important. And why I try to keep it at 25%, it's because I don't want to become a, a service company. And I think that uh, we have to have a strategy between, of course, very good professional services, but as well a lot of partnership with agencies, etc., who can uh, handle with the tool as well. I think it's the same for you. We have to have uh, both uh, strategy and not become uh, just uh, an agency with a tool. Just to, to, to close this subject and to add something, I, I think that uh, uh, at, uh, at Launch Metrics, we did some tremendous progress uh, in, in customer satisfaction and re reduction of churn by uh, dedicating people to adoption. It's not professional services, it's people that are not invoice, that are just there to um, take care of the customers and increase the, the level of satisfaction. Uh, our customers are the most important brands in fashion, luxury, and beauty. beauty um, we, with the uh, obviously uh, high level of services required and the fact to have really dedicated adoption teams in all the country where we are uh, close to the customers and really in, uh, has been helpful to, to, to build a relationship and, and to develop large accounts. Perhaps uh, roughly because uh, we just have a few minutes left. Sorry. A little bit about KPIs. <laughs> because SaaS business is uh, all about KPIs. Uh, you, you, should, uh, you should speak the language, this horrible language like uh, churn, MRR, CMRR, uh, CAC, CAC ratio, uh, all of that. Uh, for those who are not familiar with that, uh, you have a very good literature on, on the web. Uh, it's uh, Bessemer 10 laws, the first uh, lesson, uh, lesson uh, to, to really uh, learn about all these ratios. Uh, and the second one is really to um, look at the Pacific Crest report uh, every year where you can benchmark your ratio with the market. Uh, nevertheless, I, I think that we, we all have our uh, favorite KPIs. Uh, as, a, as an investor uh, monitoring a lot of companies, what, what are the most important ones for you, uh, Rafi? Yeah, I, th I think the first thing we look at, uh, obviously, is uh, where the, MR the MRR is and how fast it's growing. Just to give you an idea, uh, Series A's in France happen uh, with companies that are 100K MRR more. Uh, and Series B happen when they reach 3 to 500K MRRs, basically. Seeds happen somewhere between 0 to 50. Immediately after, we, we know the, the MRR and how fast it's growing. We know if it's one, uh, adapted for Series A, and two, uh, exciting enough uh, because the growth is there or not. Uh, once we're beyond that, I think w one figure we, we like to look at is the return on investment in months, uh, the, um, how, how fast you can re um, return the cost of uh, acquiring the customer, basically. Uh, the, the good figures we see are somewhere uh, between three months and eight months at early stages. Three months is absolutely outstanding. Most often around five, six months. Uh, and then it grows very fast uh, up to a certain uh, level at which we, we don't believe in the business anymore. Uh, I, I think below 500K, we expect the return on investment to be below one year, basically. Uh, and beyond that point, uh, there are doubts about uh, the scalability of the model and uh, the, the feasibility of, uh, of achieving a, a very big company. So that's basically the three figures we will look at immediately. Um, if we go uh, beyond that point, I think there's a great variety, as you said, uh, of KPIs we could look at, but uh, it's most of the time specific to, to every business. Uh, enterprise soft software uh, and moving to this more enterprise uh, go-to-market means generally that you do upsell. Do you monitor uh, the, the, the upsell separately and how do you, w what are the, the best metrics uh, for you on that topic? I think one of the challenges of the, the enterprise companies is that often the, the, the first time they, they build a customer, uh, it's a relatively low ticket. Uh, statistically, it's uh, a few Ks of MRR. And, and the ambition for the, all those companies is to be able to scale the customer up to uh, hundreds of Ks of ARR, uh, which is not that easy to do. So uh, we do monitor the upsell which in a sense gives a, a flavor of uh, how the customer is accepting the, the tool and, 
how we could replicate uh, that customer with, uh, with other cases. I don't think it's the main point of attention. In general, we monitor the, the, the biggest uh, customer uh, in, in days, and we, we try to, to imagine how we could triple that number. And to triple that number, it's obviously uh, reaching out to bigger customers. Uh, that's the easy part. It is also going into different verticals where the, the value added of the product is, uh, is uh, more intense. Uh, and a great variety of things. So, so the upsell is one of the, uh, the elements. Thank you very much.